Good morning, everybody. We are politically speaking today, Thursday, July 15th, 2021. For Adam Jarko and Patty Schockner, I'm Ben Dryden, and you're watching Politically Speaking with Adam and Patty, presented by Kirkpatrick Law Offices. Matthew Kirkpatrick provides experienced, professional, efficient, and effective representation in criminal defense, collections, and other legal areas. For more information, you can find Kirkpatrick Law Offices on Facebook or simply go to mzklawyer.com, mzklawyer.com. Uh, special thank you to former 75th Assembly Representative Romaine Quinn for being my co-host on last week's Breakfast with Tiffany show featuring Congressman Tom Tiffany. In case you missed it, you can watch that on our website, our YouTube uh, channel. Just go to YouTube and just search for Dryden Wire. You'll find it in there. And next Thursday, I will be back for... I'll be back with Rebecca Clayfish. I think that's her third time that she'll be on uh, for a show, the former lieutenant governor, and let's face it, likely going to be the candidate for Republicans, I think, maybe, in the governor's race. (laughs) And then two weeks from today, the senator from the 25th and current Senate Minority Leader Janet Bewley will be jumping on to wrap up our Thursday political shows for July. But today we're politically speaking with Adam and Patty. Patty, we'll start with you. Good morning. What's new with you? Good morning. Uh, Just getting off a a pulse increasing basketball game, watching the Bucks last night. Uh, It was a great game, just back and forth, back and forth. Uh, Just what competition's all about. Loved it. My husband and daughter were there at the game. So they were like, yeah, yeah, they were spazzing, just totally spazzing. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) And that. So it was a fun night. And last I, so it's kind of like this uh, standard or perception that it, when it comes to basketball, it's a best of seven series. It really doesn't become a series until one team beats the other team on their court. Phoenix won the first two in Phoenix. Milwaukee's now won the, the last two in their court. How does this end, Patty? Uh, by the way, Fitzy and I had a little bet on this, not money wise, but he says Milwaukee will win in six. I say Phoenix in seven. What do you have? I'm I'm going with Milwaukee in six. I really am. I think, oh, it's uh, so fun. I'll be accepting yours and Fitzy's apology in a little over a week from now. <laughs> um, Adam, good morning. Uh, what's going on with you, man? Good morning. How are you? Fantastic. We're doing the show. I love it. <laughs> how, how have you been? Good. I've been good. I've got uh, projects going on at the businesses, trying to take advantage of the weather and... Um, laying a whole bunch of sod at one of the businesses today that we're doing a little patio project at. So as soon as I'm out of here, get on your, get on your work shoes, Ben, and come join us in laying some sod. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I, I, don't, I don't do manual labor. No. No, not at all. Well, we have a ton of things we want to get to. Uh, as always, anyone that is unfamiliar with the show, uh, each of you kind of submit three questions or topics you want to discuss for a total of six. Obviously, today it's going to be a little more geared towards the budget that just happened last week in terms of what Evers had done. So before we get into those six, I just kind of want to do a little preview here by asking you this question. Um, And Patty, we'll start with you. And the question is just this. In terms of the budget itself, what was the good, the bad, and the ugly in it? So I think uh, from my perspective, the the good is the, the investments in broadband. I mean, clearly this is a huge problem and it impacts everybody from uh, the rural parts of the state to the uh, urban parts. And uh, around here in rural Wisconsin, we need access to to uh, uh, rural to to broadband. It's it's just the 21st century. We need to get there. Uh, The bad is the constant in in my uh, perspective. It's just the constant pitting against each other over and I mean, I'm so over it. It's just like, just, you know, come up with your documents and just pass them and stop the, stop the stuff, the, bu- the bull crap. And um, I think, you know, what we can improve on is investing uh, in education. Clearly, after the uh, year of the pandemic, there's going to be lots of deficiencies. There's going to be lots of things that we need to look at. And now, as we see surges coming again, um, what the school year looks like is going to be uh, interesting. Nobody can nobody can guess. I, it's going to be open, but it's going to be rolling, uh, and uh, it'll it'll be interesting to see how we go from here. Okay, that wasn't an ugly. Do you have an ugly? 
I, I think it is. A, I think the, the uh, pandemic and how it goes is going to be an ugly because um, we are in such a polarized uh, uh, position now because of education. I, I see it only getting worse. Sure. Adam, same question. What's the good, bad, and the ugly from uh, this conclusion of the budget? You know, but I just have to address the pandemic. It's over, Patty. It's done. The pandemic's over. Trump lost, so the pandemic can be a done. We can all move on. It's okay. We're we're good. <laughs> uh, good, good, bad, and ugly on the budget. So this was, in my opinion, the best budget that I've seen since Governor Walker's first budget, which was the Act Ten, Act Thirty Two budget. It was a very good budget. It kept spending in check. When Governor Evers opposed, uh, proposed the budget in February, it was over 1,800 pages of liberal wish list nonsense. And the Joint Finance Committee cut that down to 400 pages of good, solid investments in the things that we ought to invest in. Kept spending in check, had a generational size tax cut, um, repealed the personal property tax, which Evers uh, vetoed with his line item veto. And that to me is the ugly, I cannot believe of all the things to veto the personal property tax cut. That is the single stupidest, most ineffective, inefficient tax that we have on our books and it needs to go away. And I just, and even in his veto message, he said, oh yeah, you know what? It really should go away. It's a dumb tax, but I'm vetoing it anyways. So, come on, man. (laughs) As a small business owner, we we have to pay accountants every year to fill out these stupid taxes and they raise like four bucks for the local government. I pay more to the CPAs to fill fill out the tax return or the tax form sure. um, than we do to actually pay the tax. Sure. The local governments hate the tax. Uh, the business owners hate the tax. Everybody hates it except apparently Governor Evers likes the personal property tax. So from a uh, uh, political but, from a political standpoint, uh, was this by by him uh, signing it, not just you know complete veto and doing line items? Does does this show either of you any insight or give you any insight or kind of a thought process now that, yeah, he's totally running for governor. And obviously that he had announced that, but is this one of those things that he had to do if he had wanted to win or because he did the line item vetoes, that was enough for his base? Where does this put him in terms of his reelection? To who, who are you addressing Evers. this to? Oh, no. for either one of you. Adam. Um, I think uh, that at the beginning, I think uh, real supporters wanted a 100% veto, just b- veto it all and mm-hmm. make the legislators come back. Um, I think a lot of people were shocked that he didn't do that. But I think there's a reason that he put in a 1800 page budget to see what opportunities could be, knowing that, uh, you know, what, what he had in mind on how he was going to do things. And of course, uh, the Republicans fell for it hook, line and simple uh, sinker because they just came out whining. They got what they wanted, came out whining like the pansies they are. <laughs> so it was like, it was so obvious. It's yeah. like, you guys are such not strategic. <laughs> yeah. And that is actually a topic that we're going to bring up because you had written this down and we'll get to that. I think are two more from now. And your question is, why did GOP leadership make such childish, childish Pee Wee Herman like, I know you are, but what am I, <laughs> statements about the governor saying the budget. So we're going to get to that in a second. Um, but just from the political standpoint, uh, Adam, did he need to do it the way he did it if he uh, wanted to fast forward, educate us, give us some insight? Is this going to help him or hurt him by what he did in terms of uh, his election, re election chances? Oh, I think that will definitely help him. I think um, I I fully expected that he would um, uh, veto the budget or at the very least would veto out the tax cut that was in there that the Republicans put in there. If you remember the debate in the legislature and the Joint Finance Committee, every single Democrat called it a tax cut for the rich. So Governor Evers signs a tax cut for the rich, according to his party. But he messages it the way it ought to be messaged because it actually is what it is. It's a middle tax, middle class tax cut. And for him to sign it was politically very wise. Um, he has now signed two Republican budgets in a purple state. Um, he signed a tax cut. So he's going to run on a tax cut. Um, he's, he signed budgets that's kept, that keep spending in check. 
that increased spending for education. So all of these things that he wants to run on are in that budget, and he will be able to run as sort of this, you know, middle of the road uniter. He doesn't have to win a primary, so he doesn't have to. The base is the base is not voting for his base is not voting for Becky Clayfish, no matter what. Right. So he knows his base is locked up. What he's going for is the middle and the independents. And by sure. signing this budget, he did himself a lot of political good. And honestly, I didn't think his team had it in him. They've been pretty politically inept, but they did a heck of a nice job by politically by having him sign this budget. All right, and I, I, I guess I didn't want to spend this much time on it, but I kind of have to follow up with this question here. If this was the budget two years ago, therefore not an Evers uh, campaign or you know gearing up for a campaign, if this scenario happened two years ago with the exact same budget, would it have been the same outcome, Adam? No. Uh, one of the reasons that he was able to sign this budget and feel fine about it is because, remember, he's got all this ARPA money that's mm-hmm. sitting in a bank account for him to, to slosh around. And that's why the Republicans really narrowed down the spending is because they knew he had three or four billion dollars of a slush fund that if he wanted to throw some more money at broadband or education or what have you, he would be able to do that sure. uh, because they, they essentially have no control over that money. The other thing is um, I, I think that when you get closer to an election and you start looking at the polling and his numbers are just a little bit upside down, his approval ratings appear to be in the mid to high 40s, you know, he's got to bump that up a little bit. So sure. I, I think, you know, this being right where it is, is was the ideal time for him to sign a budget like this. Sure. Patty, do you think two years ago, same scenario, same question, would he have signed it, oh, done I, the exact same thing if it was two years ago? I, I think Adam's 100 percent right. I mean, right now, strategically, this was the right thing to do to get ready for the 2020 to uh, elections um, and and you can and he can run on uh, being a uniter and thinking about everybody and I think it'll be and it'll be hard for the GOP to to um, come up with uh, arguments especially if there's more money in uh, even the most independent or the most uh, far uh, conservatives pocket if they have more money they're going to be happy so and they needed the governor to sign that to get that Sure. So I, I think it'll make a real robust uh, election season. Uh, and actually, that leads us to our next uh, or one of the first things that, Adam, you had written down you want to discuss. And that was Evers signs the budget and touts Republican tax cut. Why? Yeah, well, we kind of talked about it. I mean, politically, yeah. I, I think that it was a political reason for him to sign that. And I don't think people can kind of overstate the importance of this tax cut. Wisconsin, if you just kind of look at our overall tax amount that we pay is one of the highest tax states in the country. Even after the Walker years and the tax cut during the Walker years, we're still one of the higher tax Mm. states in the country. So to to move down the rates across um, the the various tax brackets is huge. It's a huge thing. And for me, um, as I see business owners sell their businesses and move to South Dakota, Texas, Florida to avoid um, our high tax environment, this is the kind of thing that keeps people here. This is the kind of pe- thing that se- that makes people think, maybe I don't want to live in Texas and I can stay here because my taxes won't be quite as high. Sure. So we're getting closer to that place where we have some equal- equilibrium. We're not there yet. We still have some, some work to do on our tax environment, but this went a long way. And I think Governor Evers signed it mostly because of politics, mm-hmm. um, but I'm glad he did because it's great policy. Sure, it is, but um, I think the, even the headline when his press release came out was that you know he signs like largest tax cut or uh, he, he and I understand this is probably just politics, but he kind of took a lot of the credit for it, which you know he was. And he, actually, when he was announcing this, I was watching it on Facebook. I don't know what school it was. It was last week, and the first question from a a reporter at the school was, um, "Are you just taking credit for the Republicans' budget?" And I think his response was, "Well, hey, I signed it." So I should take credit for it. So I I understand that. But, Patty, um, same question to you. Does it seem as though that, and maybe that's just how it works, you kind of take credit for something? Because if I recall, this is not what he wanted. And in terms of he, that means also the Democrats. That is nothing even close to what they were asking for. So then to take credit for that, I don't know, are you okay with that? Or is it, yeah, that's just how it works. Uh, Well, I think uh, most people don't care. Uh, they just want to know what the outcomes are, sure. you know, but I mean, right. in a process, yeah. Yeah. Gover- gover- government is process yeah. and the 
the governor has to put out his vision of what he wants for a budget. JFC takes it, throws it out and says, here's what we want for a process. They can either include or, or not include things. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, the only way it gets passed uh, is if the governor signs it. So mm -hmm. that is the process and you need the governor to sign it in order to happen for it to happen. So yeah, I mean, if he didn't sign it, he'd have to take credit for that also. So it's just the way the process sure. is. And most people don't pay attention to process, just the outcomes. And I think this was the was the first time in a long time that uh, the Republicans got that right in their face. And it's like they needed the governor to sign their budget in order for it to go through. And then when he did and took credit for it, they were uh, they wanted it. Yeah. And uh, it uh, that process part is what was yeah. uh, not what they were used to. Yeah, and so that will lead us to our next question, but it just seems like, unless I'm wrong here, it's almost like a win-win. Actually, a win-win-win. I think that may be in what was in there, and I think, Adam, you've talked about this before, the best part, actually, Patty, you as well, where you have the, the Democrats so far on one side and the Republicans so far on the other, but when you compromise and you find something in the middle, that's where the best bills get done. That's where that, that's good for our state. Uh, but it seems like Republicans, I don't know if a win is the right word, but I, maybe, right? It's their budget, so they kind of get a win. Uh, Democrats and governor kind of gets a win. And of course, Wisconsin, I think, kind of gets a win. Uh, but let's move on. So let's bring up that topic now, Patty. You would ask, why did GOP leadership make such childish Pee Wee Herman-like statements about the governor signing the budget? Go ahead, Patty. <laughs> it was just so stupid. It just made him sound like the poor loser in the playground that didn't get his way. It's just like, oh, my God. Get that. They could have just said, okay, you know what? We both gave a little. We came together and we signed the budget. Let's move on and let's start talking about all the, the ARPA money because that they, they want to be part of that conversation. But instead, it was like, you know, you, you can't take credit for this and it's mine. It's, it was just, it was like watching my, my children when they were, you know, in high school. And I just, I literally just wanted to send them both to their room. I mean, Voss and Lemahieu. I just so go to your room and think about this and come back when you can have something good to say, you putzes. That's how I felt. <laughs> okay. Uh, Adam, response to that? <laughs> Well, this is this is just politics, right? You right. have to you have to have your side understand what you've done for them. And so the messaging here is really important. It is not very often that you see a budget that has z literally zero policy. And whether you like some of the policy that's been in the budget or not in the budget, I mean, this is one of those things that from for decades on a bipartisan basis, people have said we should keep policy out of the budget. And there was literally zero policy. It was all just spending. And so for the Republicans to say, hey, we did that. We we kept spending in check, actually spending below the rate of inflation. We cut taxes. I mean, we. I, I just feel like they need to get that message out. And in their defense, they don't have the bully pulpit. If Governor Evers says anything, the media covers him, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with Governor Walker or Governor Doyle. I mean, that's how yeah. it works with with the executive branch. Mm -hmm. um, and and if you ask people in the state who's Robin Voss, they'd say, no idea. Who's that? Never heard of him, right? And and so they don't. So it's much more difficult for legislative leadership to get their message out than it is for the governor. So you know, part of it is to throw to throw some knives once in a while, and that catches yeah. some media coverage. Sure. Uh, a quick follow up to that. Um, uh, Adam, I'll just go right back to you because you kind of touched on this. Do you believe that sh policy um, should never be in a budget? Or am I asking that right? Or should or it, are you okay with that? Or like 100 percent, no matter who's the governor, Republican, Democrat, who cares who's controlling the assembly or uh, who's the power there? Uh, should policy be in the budget? So I situationally believe that policy should not be in the budget. <laughs> If your guys oh, in, dur. yeah, yeah dur. If, if it's the policy, if it's the policy I like, then it's good. Okay, makes sense. Well, I'll, I'll give you an honest talk. answer. So. Okay, I think that was an honest I'll answer, but okay. Honest. When when I um, when I was in the legislature, my view of the world was the people of the twenty eighth hired me to do a job, to get stuff done, and if that required that I had to say I'm a no on the budget unless I get this, that, or the other thing in there 
then that's what I would do. And so I don't know if that's the right answer, but it was certainly the answer that I had. So probably in a perfect world, policy shouldn't be in the budget, but in the political world where it's really hard to get anything done, and if this is your one opportunity to get something done that's important for your constituents, you know, I just said, well, whatever. I guess I'm not a perfect guy, but I'm going to try to put this in the budget. Sure. Patty, same question. (laughs) Well... (laughs) The reality is, it's not about the constituents. It's about the Wisconsin Manufacturing Group, and they oh, have a lot of policy. Lord. <laughs> and that, and the, all the big money and all that, their stuff, and they've, they've, uh, you know, helped the Republican Party so much that so they need to, you know, get on their knees and give them what they want. So that's oh. what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my lord! Can you keep it clean, Ben? I love this. Can you throw the flag? Come on, give it off the flag! (laughs) Wow! Uh, Wow! uh, Adam, response to that one before we move on? Yeah, I just, I just like Patty to remember back to the time a long, long time ago in a world far, far away when the Democrats were actually in full control of the state government. And they did exactly the same thing. They stuffed the budget full of policy, and Doyle Doyle signed a bunch of policy. I mean, that's just that's just how it works when you have full control. Sure. Yep. <laughs> You're watching uh, Politically Speaking, my favorite show ever, with Adam and Patty, presented by Kirkpatrick Law Offices. Matthew Kirkpatrick provides experience, professional, efficient, and effective representation in criminal defense, collections, and other legal areas. For more information, you can find Kirkpatrick Law Offices on Facebook. Or simply go to mzklawyer.com. So the next up here, uh, Sanctuary Bill. Adam, you have in here, why did Evers veto the Second Amendment Sanctuary Bill? Is that a, what, something you want to touch on first, or do you, do you just want to ask Patty that question and then discuss it then? Well, I thought it was interesting because we kind of touched on this based on a question Patty asked in the last show. Yep. And then we had the bill pass the legislature and Evers vetoed it. And so... Um, I was curious to know, you know, Democrats always tell me they're for, they're for local control. This bill would have said, hey, in the state of Wisconsin, we're not going to enforce federal firearms laws that, um, you know, violate the Second Amendment and Evers vetoed it. So apparently Governor Evers is not for local control. I don't maybe I'm wrong. Is he for local control, Patty? Uh, well, I think it's how this whole thing has been packaged and it's so polarizing. I know a lot of Republican gun owners who are totally against this, uh, that did not want this sanctuary stuff because of the way it has been packaged and sent out locally. I mean, we had it here uh, in uh, St. Joe Township and people th- that you would never expect would that to support uh, not having it were supporting it because it scared them. And um, I think the Republicans went about it the wrong way in uh, messaging this because it, when you're sitting there telling people you got to have your guns in and not, no, we want it all local control and it, it causes chaos because we don't, uh, we don't see what they're trying to tell us to be afraid of. And I think that was the, the big mistake that happened here locally. I watched the, the St. Joe Township thing pretty close and, and it was like people just could not relate to the message that was out there it made it more scary for gun owners. And um, uh, I think they need to rethink this plan if they want to do something like this. It was, a, it was a big lose, and I'm glad the governor did it to make sure everyone goes back and, and really talks about this in a smart way and not a political way. Because the political thing did not work with this here gun sanctuary uh, thing at all, in, in my opinion. And that's why it was tabled in St. Joe. I'm not sure if there was an answer in there. Uh, Adam, did you hear one? <laughs> it's, I mean, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's a I, tough one. Gov- it is. The, well, the governor, the, the governor doesn't call me and tell me what he's thinking. What? I'm Why just not? glad that he did what he did. <laughs> okay. Well, because That's... I'm a because, because I'm a loser. I'm no longer relevant. Come on. <laughs> That's why we have you on the show. Hey, can I? Yeah, go ahead, Adam. <laughs> can, can can I hijack your show for a second? I had oh, a really man. interesting discussion. On, on a policy issue that is a vexing policy issue um, with with a group of folks, people who are really trying to figure out the right way to do good policy, what, what people some people think is good policy, and how to message it. So there's this issue of felons owning firearms. 
And we have a lot of people in Wisconsin who had a felony when they're 18, 19, 20, you know, they distributed some weed or something. And now they're 50 years old and they still can't own a firearm. And even when I was knocking doors, when I used to run for office, people would say, you know, I screwed up when I was a kid, and, but I'd really like to bring my, my grandkid out hunting. And so we're talking about people that are nonviolent felons and they've been off what you call off paper for many years. And it's a vexing issue that I've heard lots about. And I think there would be bipartisan support for the idea of restoring in some respect gun rights for nonviolent felons. And I was curious if Patty had any thoughts on that or how, how do we get a bipartisan coalition of people together that would say there are a group of people who sh probably it's time to restore their gun rights? Uh, you know, Adam, I think you're 100 percent right. I mean, I know some of these people and uh, it, it's but the, again, it's the messaging because they always make it sound and I'm sure it's on both sides, but it's like, well, it's that scary person over there that this is going to happen to. And he, and he or she is going to come after you for that reason. Nobody gets it. And right. that and it, and it's like, you know, when you know people who we are a system that talks about, you know, you pay your debt to society through incarceration and then you you've paid your debt to society. But for some reason, for some things, we want people to be labeled with that for the rest of their life, and it limits their opportunities right. in many different areas. And um, you know, and that's a whole nother topic with reforms and all that. But I think uh, a lot of these uh, policies and laws could be revisited, and I think a lot of people would agree that there should be changes and updates, and it wouldn't be scary. But we need to stop using. <laughs> I'm taking a screenshot of that real quick. Because oh, I missed that's, that. That's where we are right now. Huh? No, but I, I mean, it, it's like it. This here, this here topic could be a come together topic if we used intellectual conversation instead of fear. Is that something that could get done in huh. Wisconsin, or is that a federal thing? I, I, I literally don't know anything about it. I don't a gun. Hate guns. People should own Wisconsin. them and go hunt and kill and whatever. That's fine. I mean, like animals, not you know, people. Um, so it is a Wisconsin thing. That is something that could get done in Wisconsin. Yeah. Do you think it uh, that will ever could. be a thing? Uh, I, I think there's a growing bipartisan consensus on what you might broadly call criminal justice reform, that there are some things that we have done in the past that doesn't that don't make sense. This is kind of a small piece of a bigger picture. So um, I don't know if it would be part of a bigger reform package or if this is part of part of just, you know, one thing that you would do. But I, I, I just I've had this sense that there would be some support for this. But I think Patty's right that it would also be demagogued by some people, you know, particularly in, for example, in an election season that says, oh, you know, candidate X isn't in support of giving, you know, felons violent felons the right, and it wouldn't be for violent felons, right? It'd be for nonviolent offenders that have been off paper for so long, but it would get demagogued, I think. And that's oh. that's the fear of people who run for office is if they get behind this, then it's going to be a TV ad somewhere someday. Sure. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, and that's really unfortunate because there, there's a lot of good work that could be done if uh, part of the fear wasn't your reelection. You know, if you just worked right. on good policy to get stuff done and weren't worried about reelecting or getting reelected, you could get a lot more work done. Yeah, and that is a topic for another day. But no kidding, I want to have that conversation. That would be a wonderful show talking about the campaign side of it and how that affects bills and mm -hmm. decision making. Boy, we could do a deep dive on that. I would love it. But we need to move on to the next one here. And this is from Patty. And your question was, why are vaccines becoming such a hot topic? You had a little bit more in there, but I can't find that sheet. So vaccines becoming a hot topic. Patty, go ahead. Here we go. <laughs> now I'm taking a screenshot. <laughs> and Adam will go to you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, I'll I'll try to answer Patty's question. I think I think there's two things to it. One is um, we have an all time low trust level in the government. So if the government tells us that the sky is blue, I think there's a lot of us, and I include myself in this um, group of people who will look outside 
to make sure that the sky is blue. And even if it's blue, I will still wonder, did the government put something out there to make it blue because it's not really blue? I think that's the level of skepticism that a lot of us have because we've been lied to over and over by Republicans and Democrats for so long on so many topics that there's just zero trust. Then you add into it a pretty rushed process for vaccines, not fully approved. It's kind of, I don't know what the technical term is, conditional approval or whatever. Um, You add into it, you kind of have one political side of the aisle that is making a much bigger deal about COVID than the other side of the aisle. And you have a recipe for, I think, a lot of dissension and discussion about this vaccine issue. Um, one thing, one issue that I think is interesting, I saw some polling recently and, you know, everybody says, oh, it's all these, you know, Neanderthal Trump people that won't take the vaccine. It actually really isn't the, the group, the group of people who are least likely to have been vaccinated, at least according to polling, are people who are not really politically connected to any party. They're sort of in the middle, don't pay much attention to politics, are sort of politically unplugged, are the most likely. And then really the Republican and Democrat side of of the kind of anti-vaccine breaks down similarly. You might see um, uh, uh, Robert Kennedy is, of course, a very liberal Democrat and Robert Kennedy Jr. and sort of on the far left. And he's against the vaccine and talks about it all the time. And then the far right is against the vaccine. Um, and, And then you have kind of this politically disconnected group that's against it. But I think, you know, Um, I think that's kind of the recipe for it. And of course, the media adds to it as well, right? I mean, you you guys in the media, you love to get clickbait out there. So I blame it mostly on you, Ben. (laughs) Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. (laughs) So we were just, you know, uh, I swear we weren't making funny at all, Patty. Mm -hmm. But don't go back and watch Uh, the replay of the show when we're finished. (laughs) So uh, we're back to you now. So he was just talking about vaccines and pretty much saying how you're wrong on everything all the time. Um, including this topic. So uh, it's back to you. Uh, Why are vaccines, do you believe, becoming a hot topic again? Again, it's like everything else. Everything has to be turned political. Um, And, you know, when it comes to the the whole topic of vaccines and what's going on right now, um, you know, you look at Missouri and it's, it's a hot mess and 90 plus percent of the people in the hospitals are unvaccinated. 100% of the people dying of uh, the Delta variant are unvaccinated. So it's, and 85% of our senior citizens are vaccinated, which means that the people that are getting it are younger. And uh, it's it's just a recipe for a disaster that is 100% preventable. And I know I'm vaccinated. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I want to travel. I want to go and do things. I, uh, that, that, but you know, I have 12 grandchildren, and five of them are under the age of 12. So even though my whole family is vaccinated, the littlest, most vulnerable ones are not, and are up to you know they're dependent, just like my. Uh, people were dependent uh, on other people with uh, last year with the elderly. Now it's the the new vulnerable uh, population is younger people. And it just worries me. Um, You know, I know what it was like to lose someone to COVID. And there are a lot of people that will say, well, you know, he was old and and he had preexisting. So it was to be expected. Um, It's 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 not true. And um, I know people that have gotten COVID in the last uh, two months since the summer. And, uh, you know, one of them was in the hospital for almost 70 days. And now he's home with Mm. oxygen. I know another one that was unvaccinated that he had blood clots so bad they had to lance his legs to let his legs breathe. So the the long hauler effect in not uh, getting vaccinated is huge, it's preventable. And now they're talking about the neurological deficits that are gonna happen. And even if it's only 10% of the population, when you think about the long-term impacts that's gonna be financially for disability uh, people, mm-hmm. uh, that alone, if your deficits are all neurological, there that there is now a system problem that's gonna be that's going to have to be addressed uh, 10 years from now. So um, I I think it's bigger than that. And I I wish that uh, 
people would just stand up and and really the people that are in leadership positions, you shouldn't have to have a rock star sing a song for young people to get vaccinated. Um, we shouldn't have to have um, middle-aged people who have been that their parents had them vaccinated because their parents and grandparents lived through polio, measles, mumps, and all that their stuff. And now we're we're going backwards on this topic, and it's going to have huge financial impacts uh, long term uh, because of lack of vaccinations. Uh, Adam, any response? Yeah, two things. One, I think saying that kids are vulnerable is just flat out wrong. The, the data is very clear that young kids have literally zero vulnerability to COVID. I mean, statistically, zero kids have gotten um, very sick or died from it. Now, you might say, oh, there was this kid here, or this kid there. That's still statistically zero young kids. So I actually think, and I, I've had the vaccine, the J&J vaccine, um, but I actually think vaccinating kids is beyond idiotic and we should not be doing that to kids. This is a vaccine that has not gone through the full testing process. Um, I would not, at, and under any circumstances, vaccinate my eight-year-old kids against COVID because they're at zero risk and I'm okay taking whatever small risk there is for the, with the vaccine for myself and, you know, but for kids, definitely not. Um, and the other thing is, I think this is what happens when we politicize things, when we politicize public health. And that's what happened through COVID. And that's why when we started seeing this shutdown nonsense by Democrat governors, and then the rest of us had to dig in, it automatically makes it a political issue. And we never should have done that. And I think this is, we're still, we're still seeing the effects of turning COVID into a political issue. Um, the last thing I would say is Democrats tend to take it far more seriously than Republicans. I think most of us, you know, I, I have changed my life 0% um, over the last 18 months. And I think most of my friends have changed our lives 0%. And yes, we've had some friends that have gotten sick. And yes, we've had some folks that we know that have actually passed away. I've got a really good friend that has been in the hospital for a long time and he's just coming out of it from COVID. So we understand that there are some serious consequences from it. On the other hand, we have to live our lives too. We can't just shut down the world because of something like this. And I think the the response by the political class was so screwed up to this that it has caused so many people in the country to just be turned off by the whole thing. Mm. Well, we've talked about that before many times, Patty I and you, you I, and Adam. I like, I like to push back a little bit on that. Um, and really, uh, when you think about schools, it, you know, they were, you know, in and out of schools and lots of different choices and fully masked during the education process. So statistically, it's like a no brainer that kids didn't get COVID. I, it, it just doesn't, that, I mean, that's so, that's so simple. Um, when we talk about science though, um, you need, I mean, my dad, when he was uh, diagnosed with myositis gravis, and this was long before he had any other things, he signed up for experimental uh, programs. He literally had his blood washed. They took all his blood out of his body, washed it, put it back in his body, and knowing that he would get a critical infection, he went through that process three times because he believed in science. Um, my uh, brother-in-law had lymphoma. He went through stem cell uh, treatment long before it was common practice. And without him stepping up as a 19 year old, as a freshman in college saying, you know what, you can use my body so that uh, other people will live. And because that's what science is about. Science is about learning as we go and then figuring it out. And this whole uh, type of thing, uh, this argument not to utilize science, parents use science all the time with a hope that their child will will um, survive a lethal disease, and this this argument if is one of those things that you don't get it both ways. The only way we can modernize uh, medicine and, and science is through trials, and there are things that go bad, and we all know that. But if you believe in science, then you're going to reap the rewards of it. And I think for those of us that are vaccinated and that have done everything that we can to make sure that everyone close to us is vaccinated, um, we have a different, maybe a different perspective. But you don't get to argue um, 
that this is not going to impact you when all the science says, and especially when we're looking at what's going on in all the states now as the Delta variant is uh, going everywhere, um, there's going to be some heartbreak coming, and it's 100% preventable, and it's very unfortunate. It is very unfortunate. Uh, I Adam, heard it. Any response she just to that? said, wait. She just said, wait two weeks. I've been hearing it for 18 months. Wait two weeks. It's going to get really bad. Wait two weeks. I'm waiting. I'll wait two more weeks for the Delta variant. I'm, I'm excited to see it. 600, over 600,000 people dead uh, with uh, COVID. That is not a little number. Mm. And uh, that's, that's a huge thing. So yeah. 600,000 people, and we all know someone, and that's above and beyond the regular people that have died through regular things. Well, and I think so you said something really important. You said, you said with COVID. And I think when you talk about the people that have died, every single death is a tragedy, of course. Mm. But I, I think we are overselling how many people died from COVID. And I think the data, as we start to dig into it, are beginning to show that, that we have massively overreacted. We have, and, and, and we have, we're not quite seeing it yet, but we're about to see it with the inflation numbers that are coming out. We have destroyed our economy. We have the national debt is insane right now. Our politics are insane. Um, we have gone through far worse pandemics, epidemics, whatever you want to call it, than this, and reacted far better than we have in this situation. And we have screwed up our country for a generation over this deal. Uh, Patty, I want to move on to the next topic, but first I want to give you the final word on this. Well, I think uh, the, the reality is that when we look at public health and this here whole uh, pandemic, uh, what's happening in the United States, Wisconsin, Missouri, is not necessarily what's going on in India, Taiwan, Korea. That, so it's like moving. It's global. The pandemic is happening to the globe. It's not happening to just uh, the United States. And I think people seem to forget that. And because the rest of the world doesn't have access to vaccines like we do here in the United States, this is going to continue to impact not only uh, our economy, but our world for quite a while until everybody gets on the same page. Because it doesn't matter if everybody wants to be anti-vaxxers here in, uh, in the United States. If you don't have access to them, it impacts the globe. And if what's going on globally, we should be paying attention to. Far too many th people think if it only impacts me, that that's the world. And that is not the right view to have. That's my view, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but let's move <laughs> on here. Uh, um, Adam, you, you had mentioned something. So we have two things left and we're already behind here because we wanted to try to keep us to a 45 minute show. We're at like 42 already. Um, but that is our Biden's policies causing inflation. You had just mentioned that. So, yes. uh, but, oh, fantastic. Great. Patty, you. <laughs> We're going to fly through this. Patty, um, is our Biden's you know policies causing of, inflation? One of the policies. Uh, what's causing the inflation is people's inability to adapt to uh, what's going on uh, in the world. That's part of the problem. Uh, you know, today his policy for the child tax credit comes into effect. I think there are lots of people uh, right. here locally that are going to be so happy to have their child tax credit in their bank account today. And is that going to cause some uh, inflation? Possibly, but that was coming. We knew it was coming, you know, a year ago before Biden was in office. So blaming him for this is, uh, you know, a big pack of hooey. But, you know, that's all right. That's what the Republicans like to do. But they're going to have to go home and explain to their uh, constituents that, you know what, you getting these, these, this money to help you so that you can get child care and afford child care so that both of you can get back to work is uh, going to be a hard sell for them. So, you know, yes, inflation is, is happening and we know that, but it's not Biden's policy. It's situations and a lot of different policies. The tax, the Trump tax policies have something to do with it also. Adam? Yeah, I just, it's, that's just silly. I mean, <laughs> Biden has flooded, <laughs> has, I mean, he's absolutely flooded the market, flooded the economy with basically free money. Everywhere that you look, 
is every local government that you look at, every state government that you look at is flush with cash and they're spending it. They're sending money to individuals. They're spending money to, to businesses. This is why if you go by nearly any business in the 10th Senate district, that would normally have goods out for sale. There is nothing. There's not a car on a lot. There's not a boat to be sold. There's not a four-wheeler to be sold. So yeah, they're using the child tax credit for a new four-wheeler. And that yeah. is what causes inflation. And yeah. we are seeing massive inflation, generational inflation that we haven't seen since the last really good Democrat president, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> well, I, I would push back on that also. Um, you know, I think that uh, when when we think about, you know, everything that's going on right now, if we need people to get back to work, uh, of course, child care is a huge piece to this. And I think lifting children out of poverty because of the situation they were born in, not one that they caused, is something we should all uh, be able to support. But um, of course, wealthy white men are totally against that because it might help, uh, you know, poor white women, especially single moms. We don't want to help them. So this is really, really important for to help our children really get to where they need to be. And if you don't think that's true, go to the St. Croix Valley United Way. Do the Alice report at how our communities are asset limited, income restrained, and how many of our people are living paycheck to paycheck because they can't afford to live hmm. even in Polk County, Barron County, St. Croix County, because you have to have a household that if a family of four that makes nearly $38 an hour combined to just make ends meet hmm. in St. Croix County. So this is way bigger than uh, just this chat. Kyle, child tax policy. Well, we, we caught, I think, like 90% of that. There's a part of it that broke up there. I think that was Zuckerberg, uh, 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 you know, controlling what you're saying. Wait, you're a Democrat. <laughs> Never mind. He's perfectly fine with it. Um, <laughs> Adam, your response to that before we move on to the next one. I'll give you the final word on that. No, let's move on. I got sod delay. Got it. Uh, here's the last one. Patty, this is from you. What are the two best outcomes of policy, either national or state, the other party did that was good in the last four years and why? So my, t I had to think long and hard on this because I like challenging questions and that. But uh, number one, uh, I think the fact that President Trump fast-tracked the the uh, vaccine was a good thing. I think I, I'm really happy and I, I can't believe he doesn't get more credit for it. I can't believe that he hasn't taken more credit for it and uh, utilize this a, a bit more. But I think the, the manufacturing and the, the introduction of the vaccine was huge. My second is the tax laws and how it has impacted uh, my 401k. Uh, only 39% of the people in the United States actually have 401ks, and it's because of the policies uh, that, uh, you know, we have a very robust uh, 401k. So even though you might not think it, I, I do, uh, and I am very grateful to be in a position uh, of privilege that uh, our 401ks are going to enable us to have a good retirement. Most people don't have that and it is t for a real liberal that place to be because I'm grateful for it but I do feel uh, some guilt in uh, having that financial flexibility. Okay. Adam? I can't think of any but I will say <laughs> that Patty oh! you are not in a <laughs> Patty you are not in a p place of privilege and it drives me crazy when liberals say that your husband worked his tail off his entire life at that hot factory You've worked your butt off your entire life. That's not privilege. That's the American promise. When we wake up, play by the rules, and work hard, we have success. And so when you're out there whining about, oh, they can't make $38 an hour as a family, <laughs> give me a break. That's $17, $18 an hour per person. I, you know, if you work hard and play by the rules, you will have a 401k. You will have a retirement. If you follow the simple time-tested rules of, get married, have a job, buy a house, 
you're going to be just fine because this is America. And to say, oh, I'm, I'm just so privileged. No, you're not. You worked hard for it. <laughs> This such a, he's such a Republican. He can't even, even, he's no, like, he totally, no. totally fell, totally fell for the whole hook, line, and sinker. Yep, no. yep, can't get any credit. <laughs> and this is exactly why we have the polarization that we have in uh, this country. When we can't even come together and just go, you know what? This here is really a good thing. And I'm, I'm really happy about it. Um, this is why we are where we are. Do I do I think that I live in a in a life of privilege? I lived I was raised in a life of privilege. I because you know what? I always had water. I can't even imagine. I mean, when I think about the fact that I was born in Somerset, Wisconsin, I could have been born in Uganda. Well, that would have been a whole different thing, but I was born here. And just being born in America is a privilege because there are so many people that do not have what we have this mm. is a privilege <laughs> so basically everybody born in america is privileged because uh, we uh, as long as we live water? life a lot differently <laughs> clean water without without yeah. water I, what do you got i, I totally get it i what guess we got? just have different definitions <laughs> different definitions of what privilege would be in this scenario yep uh like water my wife and i huge. she she works hard uh, uh has a full-time job she you know went to college or went to you know get degrees in something, whatever. She's been at the DA's office, I think, for like 10 years. I, I run a small business. Uh, neither of us make a ton, uh, but together, you know, and we have kids and we have a house and, you know, we do fine. Um, I don't know if we're, you know, privileged or not. You know, we don't make 150 grand a year. Good Lord. Uh, but we're doing fine. And But I always remember what my dad told me. It's not what you make, it's what you spend. Uh, and I've always remembered that. So even through COVID and everything else, uh, we always have money saved away, 20 bucks here, 20 bucks there. It adds up. We're just trying to be smart about it. But don't kid yourself. I think we're probably going to start getting that child tax credit, and we're totally not going to be using it for our children. We'll probably just get a four-wheeler. All right. Uh, yeah. last, <laughs> wor <laughs> last words. Um, Adam, last words. I am so pleased to see a Democrat finally say something that's pro-America and pro-American. Patty was so 100% right. Being born in this country is the, I mean. Yeah, that's great. In this time, in this country, to be born right now in this country, I mean, you're better off than 99.999% of the history of the world. If you're poor in America, probably you still have food. Probably you still have air conditioning. Probably you still have a TV. Probably you still have transportation. And access that to a free education. Right. Yes, that has not been the case uh, historically. We are so lucky, and we are lucky because of this wonderful, awesome country that we live in. And I'm so glad to hear a Democrat say it. And <laughs> good job, Patty. Good job, Patty. Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Uh, Patty, last words. Oh my God! <laughs> uh, you know what? I am. I. I have. I've always been a proud American and a proud Wisconsinite, um, and always will be. You know, my dad served. My uh, sons served. I have one that's serving right now. Just started this week in his new job as a chief petty officer. Mm. Um, you will. You will mm -hmm. not see uh, a more proud uh, mom than this one here, and a more proud American. Mm. That's how I was raised. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of us need to just really uh, t take a step back and just really appreciate who we are, where we are, and that we do have the freedoms to say things and we do have the freedoms to, you know, agree. But you know what? Own your words. Own your words and, and just move forward. I, I am really, really so grateful. Yes, screenshot, screenshot, screenshot. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and she's gone. All right, well, that was it anyway. So sorry, Patty, that was the last word. So uh, we're wrapping up right now, uh, Patty. When you hear this later, thank you for being on. Adam, thank you as always. Uh, you've been watching Politically Speaking with Adam and Patty for a while, presented by Kirkpatrick Law Offices. Attorney Matthew Kirkpatrick provides experience, professional, efficient, and effective representation in criminal defense, collections, and other legal areas. For more information, you can find Kirkpatrick Law Offices on Facebook or simply go to mzklawyer.com. For Adam Jarko and Patty Schachner, I'm Ben Dryden saying thank you for watching, and we'll see you next month. Until then, stay safe, stay positive, and have a blessed day. See you, Adam. See ya.